Right, welcome back. Now, President Cyril Ramaphosa says that the death of author, poet, activist uh, Don Matera comes at a time when the country is facing numerous challenges. Matera died uh, yesterday at the age of 87, and he was buried at the West Park Cemetery in Johannesburg on the same day, according to Islamic rights. Uh, the president also says that Matera will be remembered as a patriot who fought for the rights of all South Africans. So for more on the life and times of Don Matera, we are now joined in studio by a literary critic, novelist and playwright, Dr. Spiwa uh, Mahala, as well as joining us on a virtual platform this morning, we have award-winning poet and author, Lebu Mashile. Good morning to both of you and thanks so much for joining us, uh, you know, to honor this great man. Uh, morning, Sakin, and thanks for having us. Welcome to you too, Lebu. Thank you so much, Sakina. Thank you for honoring Brad Don this morning. And I'll tell you what, uh, the thing is, I'm not particularly sad, you know, because I think someone like uh, Brad Don lived such a rich life. And I'm looking at us sitting here, uh, the two of you, you know, young people. And, and, and this is a testament to the man that he was and the lives that he touched. But let me just start by giving each of you an opportunity to reflect on the man that you knew. Spiwa? Oh, thank you. Well, um, obviously, I, I, I knew about the person called Don Matera when I was, uh, you know, young as, as, as a student. Uh, I think the first time I was introduced to him through the poem for Do M Band, uh, written by Wallace Rote. And um, yeah, as a literature student, I got to, to read his poetry, but it was quite an honor to finally meet him 20 years ago when I came to, to Joburg and uh, to get to work with him. And um, he, there was a metaphor that he, he, he liked about life in general, where he says, I didn't um, want to show my heart. You know, when you, it's, it's a race. And um, when you, it, we say on your marks get set, before you go, turn around and find someone you can go with. And uh, that was his attitude to life. He believed in nature and young minds. And he certainly did that. Lebu, uh, for you, you know, your endearing memories of Pratan? Um, I've, gosh, I have so many. Um, Radon was like a walking encyclopedia. He knew the history of Johannesburg and its inhabitants better than anybody else that I knew. In every community where he lived, whether it was Western Native Township, now Westbury, or Sophia Town, or Eldos, or Soweto, um, he, he got deeply involved in the lives of the people, and he saw his role as being a kind of an oral archive of the, the histories of the places where he belonged. Um, the first time I met Radon, Radon rattled off, like, for 15 minutes, you know, four generations of my family's history because we both came from Westbury and from Sophia. And I didn't know that he knew my family like this, you know? And it wasn't just me. It was so many people. Radon had, um, his identity was eclectic, but he never saw that as problematic. He saw it as a gift. He was part Tosa, Tuana. He was part Italian. He was part Khoi. Uh, mm. He spoke, you know, so many of our indigenous languages. Bradon could travel to any corner of this country and be at home. He wore his blackness and his Pan-Africanness with the same pride that he wore his coloredness. And he didn't see the two as a contradiction. I think by observing him, I learned how to have peace with my own identity, that the things that make my identity complex are also the things that allow for me to be able to move freely between worlds, and that is a gift. Um, I think it, with based on his own story, uh, you know, apartheid traumatized us as a country by putting our identities into boxes, into silos. Bradon saw that as unnatural. He saw his story as a human story, as a South African story, as a story that mirrored the stories of many other families. And, and I think that is one of the things, you know, that um, one has to hold on to as far as the teachings of Bradon goes, as uh, you say, Lebu how he was just at peace and at ease with himself and the many parts of his identity. Um, 
Pradhan had no qualms about saying I'm Italian, you know, and, and yes. many of us were like, oh, why, why, what happened? Because we feel that a lot of times we have to be almost apologetic about who we are when it comes to our identities and, you know, how we traverse that terrain. And here was a man not in only in terms of his identity, but even in terms of politics, seamlessly would move through from being a member of the African National Congress, um, you know, a youth league, and moving from that to the Pan-Africanist Congress, a charterist at heart. Like, he had no qualms about, you know, moving through different spaces and places um, without really having to change and alter who he was at his core. Yeah, absolutely. Um, he was unapologetically pan-Africanist uh, in his orientation. And um, I remember the first time I met him, uh, I, I tried to speak uh, Isizulu with a, with a, you know, a heavy Kosa accent. And he immediately switched to Isikosa and he was like, I am from the Indian, you know, and um, at some point, you know, we sent him to, to um, Shelly Village in, in Limpopo and he was speaking... Um, Tsonga with the people of the village. And he was such a dynamic person. And um, I remember one time, actually the first time I actually visited him home now, and I was getting lost. He was like, hey, yes, I'm Mohui. You know, <laughs> so he could speak different registers, you know, at the same time. And he was such a, an amazing person. Yeah. He certainly was, and that, that was what helped him to connect so easily, so seamlessly level with all of us. Uh, because uh, he also, at some point, dabbled in, you know, gangsterism uh, uh, during his formative years. And it's not something that he shied away from. You know, he proudly mm -hmm. accepted that, hey, I was there. This is what I did. Spent some time in jail. All of that made him the man who he was. He was honest about the story of his time. He was honest about his own personal journey. Radon, interestingly, Radon was a poet before he was anything else. Radon wrote his first poem when he was eight years old. He went to a boarding school in KZN, a Catholic boarding school, and he always loved, even though he was a Muslim, he always loved, uh, he had a deep reverence for the ritual of, uh, the rituals involved with Catholicism, with the beauty of the church, uh, because of his, his upbringing, going to this Catholic boarding school, and because of the fact that the nuns were the ones who realized that this little boy, this tiny little boy from Sophia Town, from Dukhaute, has a beautiful gift with language. He wrote his first poem when he was eight years old, and then eventually left school, came back to Sophia, got involved with gangsterism. But again, you know, for the line, the way he speaks about his time in Sophia Town, the line mm. between gangsterism, um, subverting the apartheid system, his activism, all of these worlds were blurred. And, and also included in that was his, was his creativity. He never stopped being a poet. As a pan-Africanist, as an activist, as a, as a leader, organizer, mobilizer, as a gangster, as a father, as a community leader, he was always a poet. The poetry was kind of the glue that held all these worlds together, and it was the offering that he made to the people before anything else. And he did that so almost you know, with, 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 without thinking, the ease with which it just flowed out of him. Um, he could find himself in a situation and then he would poetically speak about what was happening around him. Yeah, school. absolutely. Poetry was his daily language. Um, even the, I mean, well, every word that came out of his mouth was always poetic. Uh, but interestingly, the last time I, I went to see him, he, he read poetry for me, he sang, he even gave me... Um, uh, some scriptures from the Bible that I should read. I mean, speaking to what uh, uh, Lebo was saying, that he was such a dynamic person, even though he was Muslim, but he knew Christ Christianity very well. And, uh, yeah, he, he was someone who was always prepared to share anything with anyone. And then and we've got a few of, you know, his books here, um, uh, just to look at, you know, for some who may not have uh, had opportunity to engage with. But... Uh, from a critic's point of view, you know, uh, just looking at some of the works, uh, the Azanian love story, for example, uh, one of the uh, covers we have here. Let's talk about, you know, the critical acclaim of Don Matera and some of his works. 
Well, John Matera I mean, he is recognized all over the world for his work, uh, but I think uh, As I Name Love Song is one of his uh, uh, seminal collections in as far as poetry is concerned. Uh, but he wrote, I mean, there's some works like They Passed This Way. Uh, what is special about that collection, it, it sums up to me uh, the essence of John Matera's uh, poetry because he celebrated uh, others. You know, he was always yeah. affirming to other poets, other struggle icons, and that's what he does. Um, I had the privilege of publishing uh, his, uh, probably his, his last two published poems while he was still alive uh, in, in, the, in the last issue of Mbiza Journal. So he published um, a piece in tribute to Winnie Mandela there. Now, you know, I, I, I always worry about whether we celebrate enough our icons when they are still with us. And when you think of Brad Don, um, especially in the latter years now, when so many other icons um, of um, our country, some his peers, uh, some younger than him, as they passed, and we've entered this era where we actually broadcast these, he was that constant. He was, he, he was a constant presence, you know, at, at, at many of these funerals. And um, what I loved about it was that he didn't have to announce himself. And even though perhaps we could have done better, there was always that great respect level for Brad Don when he was in a room. It, it, it was just a respect that he commanded without speaking, without anyone having to read his accolades or, you know, announce him to the room. He, he was just that enigmatic presence. Bradon cast a very huge shadow because of his immense light all over this country. Uh, it's, I, I looked at the, the beautiful coincidence of him passing away on the birthday of Nelson mm. Mandela. And even last night, um, when we were at West Park and we were burying him, I mean, just the contradictions, also the complexity of his funeral, he asked specifically to be buried on the day that he died at sunset. So we were at West Park Cemetery in the evening. As, as an African person, you know, I've never <laughs> been to a cemetery at night. I've never participated in a Muslim funeral. Um, and I, I learned that many of the time, um, many, many times in the Muslim community, uh, there's a special place for women uh, during the funeral process, but many times the women don't participate, don't physically mm. go to the gravesite, or there's a designated area for them. But last night, there were, there were Pan-Africans, there were people from government, there were people from the artistic community, there were many Muslim people, there were women, there were, it was, it was like Bradon saying, you know, even in death, I am going to bring together people who otherwise wouldn't be together. I'm going to force the space to transform and everyone in the space is going to transform by default. You know, Bradon was, was a Pan-Africanist and we know that um, many of the people who participated in the liberation movements of this country, apart from the ruling party, the histories of these movements are, are not a part of the mainstream. Mm. They have, they've been erased. Many icons have been erased. Um, Brad, Brad Don wielded the authority of a national statesman and was respected by the people. It, the people invested in Brad Don as a leader and as an artist, and he appreciated deeply that deeply. And he thought he moved, he functioned, you know, he, he, he operated accordingly. Brad Don embraced everyone, whether he was in Mayfair or Nuclear or Westbury, or Sophia, or Soweto, or Eldos. He was um, Don, he was Uncle Don. He took care of people. He was the Don, you know? Um, and, and right up until the moment that he was put into the ground last night, he was challenging conventions around identity. Um, mm -hmm. He did his job, you know? He mm -hmm. did his job. And no one needed to vote for him. No one needed to give him a title. Yeah. He was a leader in this country, a true leader, an authentic leader. And, you know, if, if, if our freedom is worth anything at this moment in time, it is because of, of the contributions and the immense sacrifices of people like Bradon. 
and um, you know um, him and um, uh, Brawali Sarote, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you, you look at those people because uh, very often Lebu and, um, you know, perhaps a conversation that we should have at another time, when we look at the poets in our society, uh, those who um, weave the spoken word, um, they, they, they generally are not, and, and, and then this might be uh, rather controversial, uh, we, we, we don't elevate them to the same uh, levels in our arts as we would perhaps um, musicians or um, people in other forms of uh, the artistic world. But these two men, you know, they, they just, they were there, they were giants, and, and, and you couldn't erase them even if you wanted to. Again, these were not men who would stand on the rooftops and shout, um, but, but they were there. We knew they were there. Uh, their presence was keenly felt um, as people. So what is it about them? You know, what do you think it was that elevated them to that sort of status? I, I think, um, you know, their work spoke for itself. Um, I, I'm thinking here, Abradon, um, whom I call Dobi, um, I'm thinking Brawili Josisile, the late Brawili Josisile. Uh, these are people who have been there um, for, throughout the years. Um, if you think about uh, Toby Don Matera, uh, he chronicled the story of Sofia Town in the 50s. Uh, he's been there in the 60s. He's been there during the Black Consciousness Movement uh, in the 70s and the 80s. So this is someone who has a permanent presence in, 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 in our national consciousness. So um, through his work, and it's not only that he wrote poetry, but his community involvement. You know, uh, he, as as said earlier, he, he was a gangster. Uh, but he reformed, and um, when he reformed, uh, true to his ideals, he wanted to reform other gangsters or those who could be falling to the trap of gangsterism. So, um, you know, his poetry was great, no doubt about it, but also... Uh, don't matter the human being, the way he touched people on a daily basis. Mm. Uh, uh, Lebu, I picked up on something very interesting. This is from uh, 1980. It was by Jacques Alvarez uh, Pereira. And he wrote, Does it matter, um, matter about Don? Now, the play of words is so beautiful, the play on words, and, 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 and this is what uh, I think drew me to it. And, 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 you know, this was a work already back then about this man, because he was so interesting, uh, Don Matera. And I go back to how we celebrate our icons. And we're talking about Bra Don now, he's gone. But there's a Lebu Mashile sitting here, you know, um, what should we do better? What can we do better to show appreciation to our icons while they are with us? Give people access to the arts. Create arts and cultural centers that are within walking distance of every South African in our communities where people from small babies to elderly people can interact with the arts and with artists. There are plenty of societies, and not just the rich ones in Europe and America and the West. I mean, I'm talking about places like Colombia, places like Cuba, where the arts are a part, are so integral to everyday life. Um, in a society like South Africa, with our our you know poor literacy rates, um, the the expensive expensive price of books, to have somebody like Bradon as a literary figure be an icon of the people speaks to the way that poetry is not an intellectual as much as it is an intellectual pursuit, it's a human function. Mm -hmm. People need poetry because language is essential to who we are. It's the way that we live. It's the way that we express ourselves. So the fact that a society like South Africa, where, you know, many people right now cannot, even, cannot afford petrol, cannot afford bread, but people know that there are artists out there who have touched their lives, who happen to be poets, people like Bradon, people like Dorapetso Kositile. That speaks to a social need that people have for the arts, and that when, when artists step up 
to, to make themselves available and make their work available, people immediately understand. They resonate. They resonate across language. They resonate across medium. Expose people to the arts. Cre um, mm. Create more opportunities to bring artists into schools. Every school in South Africa, from creche to university, should have an artist in residence. Digitize artistic uh, canons, uh, our digitize artistic archives, digitize the archives of the of prolific South African artists, and make them available to people so that people can be able to understand and interact with this work. There's a reason why South African artists are able to make such a major impact globally. This country produces artists is faster than it can sustain them. The creative and cultural conditions in South Africa give birth to incredible creative talent, to incredible intellectuals. But then what happens if you live in a society that doesn't create platforms for those artists, that doesn't allow for those artists to be empowered, that doesn't create space mm -hmm. for those artists to be able to sustain themselves? There's no reason why art should be a pursuit of the elite when everybody needs art. And this is what Bradon showed. As much as people will sit and say, oh, poetry is a dying art form, people don't read. You have an, a, a political giant who was also a creative giant and used his poetry, his mind, his heart to touch the people. Uh, and that shows that when you give people access, they understand the value of a particular art form. Absolutely. You know what, as we end this, let's just take a look at uh, some of our Morning Live viewers also paying tribute to Pradhan this morning. And here are some of those tweets. Um, Miki Maraba saying, I will always remember uh, the words from his address in 2012, the University of Johannesburg. On, uh, on your marks, get set, and before you go, look around and see if you can take someone with you. Um, Don Matera, National Association of Child Care Workers, Patriot. And the next one is from uh, Chisa Wan, who says, I remember him coming to read his poems at uh, Ipolo Keng Primary in Deep Kloof. Uh, that's over 50 years ago. And we didn't understand English, but two words stuck in my mind, liberation and black power. Uh, I, I wish we could read more. You know, there are so many more, and those are so beautiful. And thank you so much to the two of you as well this morning. And I think if, if there's a little kid sitting there and they didn't know who Bra Don was, this man that everybody's talking about, they do know now. But thank you so much, uh, Lebu and Spiwo, for speaking to us this morning and, um, and joining us in praying tribute and homage to the late, great Bra Don. Um, uh, Donato uh, Matera and uh, we will continue doing so for the rest of the week but that's all our time this morning Leanne, uh, that's where we'll leave it for today Yeah, very quick goodbye from me see you tomorrow, bye bye everyone